Hello, everybody. My name is Richard Powell. I'm the Director of Global Child Safeguarding for Save the Children International. Uh, I've been doing this work for around 10 years or so now. And my current work is working with Save the Children International to try and make it a child safe organisation. And that's a bit of a challenge because we work with probably by the end of next year, it'll be about 17 to 18,000 staff members in about 120 locations with 30 members. So um, it's a fairly big challenge. And all I wanted to do in my session really was to share the experience that Save the Children has had in this area. And I'm sharing it not in the sense that uh, we feel that uh, you know everybody should copy us or, or we feel that, that we've cracked this but just in the sense that we are on a journey ourselves and it might be that other organizations will be interested in in knowing how an organization like ours has found the journey and, and some of the things that have helped and, and some of the issues that we've been aware of so it's it's about sharing experience, I guess, these, these next 30 or so minutes. Um, and the purpose then is about heightening awareness and heightening awareness of the risks, because there are risks uh, involved, and I'll talk about those. And I'll also share some of the things that we have found that have worked within our own organisation, some of the issues that have helped us. And then towards the end, there'll be a short, very short session on uh, where other people can go to find support on this journey. And uh, I found that this area of making our own organization safe is very often um, an area of work where agencies like ours just don't want to talk about it sometimes because this is difficult. Sometimes we feel that, that this is where we failed as an agency, uh, where sometimes we've, we've done things that inadvertently have resulted in children being harmed in some way, whether that's deliberately or, or by a lack of thought, really. But I've also found, as I go around the world, that um, it is encouraging to share experiences. I remember doing a, a workshop with another big agency in Haiti just after the earthquake. And there were about 26 agencies there. And simply just sitting down and sharing our experience and our strategies in making our own organizations safe uh, was, was a very helpful experience for us all. So um, I'll just start, uh, but I'll please take it in the sense that it's intended, it's uh, simply a sharing experience, an experience where humbly uh, I'm just explaining how we've gone through things. So let's look at uh, the first area, which is about heightening awareness of, of risk. And um, our work is often in some of the most difficult environments in the world with some of the most vulnerable populations and obviously with this conference a focus on human trafficking and slavery and all the risks and dangers and vulnerabilities involved there and we have to be aware that there is no way that we can eradicate all risks this is not a risk-free environment and it probably never ever will be a risk free environment. But the real issue is about how we respond to those risks and how we prepare for those risks. Really, that is the key. And the risks, broadly speaking, relate to two different groups. And the most important are the risks to children. I don't need to tell the audience that there are risks to children outside of our agencies. This is the risk that exists in every community, in every society, any place in the world where children are exploited and abused in their own families, 
in institutions and communities. However, we also know from our own experience and from what children tell us and what other agencies tell us is that there are risks associated with our own agencies internal or inside the operation of our own organization. And this is an area that often is a, an inadvertent, it's omission, it's, it's a failure, and sometimes it's a deliberate act. So sometimes the risks caused by our own agencies are deliberate, and sometimes they're inadvertent. We have adopted a definition of child abuse that talks of a number of things. It talks about individuals, institutions, and processes that harm or fail to protect. And so from our definition of child abuse, we define that if we as an agency fail to protect children, whether directly or indirectly, then we as an agency ourselves have become abusive of children. And that's a real challenge. That's a real challenge for us. So we know from looking at the risks within our own agency that there are risks associated with deliberate or non-deliberate acts. Now, over the years, certainly in the last probably 15 years, to my knowledge and my own experience, there is a growing body of evidence of exploitation and abuse by representatives from our own sector. We also know a lot more about sexual abusers who try and target our own agencies. So there is an increased understanding of the risks to children and organizations. And I've also sensed that there is, there is a much lower tolerance of abuse in this way and a much higher commitment to doing more within our agencies to safeguard children. I think that's very important to state that whilst we are aware of the increased risks and we've got better understanding there is also a, a, a zero tolerance approach that is far more obvious than it was previously so the commitment to doing more is is improved and we can see that from our own experience within say the children in the way that uh, probably 15 to 20 years ago, um, all of our child protection work was outward facing. All of our child uh, protection work was in international work. Um, and gradually over the years, we've come to understand that whilst we are trying to make the world itself a safer place for children, that we ourselves have a, a duty and a responsibility to make sure that we ourselves are safe for children. So our policies have developed and our procedures developed so that not only are they externally facing, but they also face internally as well. And there's obviously going to be a crossover between this external work and the internal work, and quite rightly so. But we do need to be aware of the different strands. Okay, let's, let's look at the uh, risks to children from within our own sector. Now we know about these risks because there have been many reports and many investigations undertaken and many pieces of research undertaken. There has been work with sexual offenders who worked within the care sector, so uh, people who've been convicted by courts we're working with agencies like our own agency. And also we know and have learned an awful lot from cases within the Save the Children family where 
things have gone wrong and where we have learned some very profound and difficult lessons, challenging lessons. So, let's look at uh, some of these reports and investigations. One of the landmark investigations that really shaped our thinking occurred in 2002 when Save the Children and UNHCR undertook an investigation of uh, exploitation and abuse by a number of agencies, including staff from INGOs, including UN representatives, including peacekeeping forces in West Africa, in three countries in West Africa. That was really a starting point of our current journey on trying to make our own agencies here because we found the findings of the report very challenging and we challenged other agencies as well. And we learned an awful lot from, from that time. And subsequently, in the same part of Africa, we've been back a couple of times to do research where first research was what trying to look at um, methods in which some children were more resilient to abuse and exploitation by people from the peacekeeping forces and from the INGO. And when our researchers visited these places, they were met with a very angry response, really. If people were saying, uh, you know, this abuse, this exploitation is still happening despite all of the words and all of the deeds and all of the policies that came out of the last piece of research, this abuse is still going on. And uh, then a, a few years later, again, we looked at humanitarian situations across the world this time. And again, that pattern of exploitative, abusive behavior was still there to be seen and was still being committed by people whose job it was, whose mission it was, was to help children. And there is no greater betrayal, really, of children and vulnerable people when the people who are there ostensibly to help and protect and enable them, themselves abuse. And the case histories and the studies paint a devastating picture of the effect of the abuse, the effect of the abuse of power and trust. There have been many studies across the world, different agencies have undertaken them as well, the UN have undertaken studies. Studies have taken place in developed countries and in developing countries. Um, as I said earlier, virtually in in every society and in every culture, there is certainly abuse and exploitation. And in many of these places, there is abuse and exploitation by people who are there to care, people who are there to help. And it's a real responsibility on us as an agency to uh, react to that and to change our thinking, really, and not to go on in the hope that this never happens, but in the understanding that we need to be proactive to prevent that from happening. We know from studies with sexual offenders, sexual offenders from the caring sector, we know that people who have a sexual interest in children have deliberately targeted agencies like Save the Children, like other INGOs, and some have even established uh, NGOs with the real purpose of having access to and abusing sexually their children. And gaining access to an agency like Save the Children or setting up their own agency allows a sexual offender access and power and respectability. And I often think uh, about the trust that vulnerable people 
people in desperate situations placed in the agencies like ours uh, worked in, in an emergency situation, for example, just after the tsunami in Sri Lanka, where people in the village uh, were absolutely dependent on me. And yet they knew very, very little about me. All they knew was that I was this guy with the red T-shirt who turned up and upon whom they, they relied. And all of a sudden, uh, I was in a very influential and powerful position in that little village. And it's absolutely essential that we do our best to ensure that our people do not abuse that position of power and trust. But we know from studies with sexual offenders that they will try to infiltrate our agencies. In a very interesting study undertaken by Dr. George Sullivan, uh, working with the UC Faithful Foundation in the UK, a large number of caring workers who've been uh, convicted of sexual offences. Something like 60% of those people said that they chose their profession, they chose a caring profession, because it meant that they could access children. And the process of grooming is becoming much better understood now. And grooming is where offenders, sexual offenders, perpetrators of sexual abuse, will create an environment where they are trusted, where they can access children, and where it's increasingly difficult for them to be uh, accused of anything because they are in this influential position. So we do know an awful lot more uh, about grooming now, and, and we do need to be aware of this. And finally, we know from case histories from within, say, the children family that uh, there have been incidences where our own people have ended up abusing children. Some of it, there's a very broad spectrum, it has to be said. Some of it has been out and out deliberate abuse of children. Some of it has been a failure of systems. And some of it has been a failure to uh, assess risks and to mitigate against risks. Um, and I'll just give you a couple of, of examples. And these are in the public domain, so I'm not sharing any, um, any special secrets with you. Um, we, we found that in the head office of one of the Save the Children members, in an accounts department, there was a person employed who was a member of an international ring of pedophiles who was actively engaged in organizing and arranging abuse on an international scale. Now, the big learning from this for me was very often staff within our agencies will say that child safeguarding and protecting against the risks is very important in the field and that exploitation and abuse can happen in the field. But we've got uh, 100 people who are accountants, who are administrative workers in the backroom uh, offices. And uh, we don't need really to, to apply the same sort of standards to them. And of course, this case showed very, very clearly that there is no department, there is no activity across the range of work that we do where we cannot apply safeguarding. We've got to apply safeguarding in every department, in every activity, whether it's in the field, in regional offices, or in head offices. So that was a real shocking case, and a case which devastated staff, and which led us to do a lot of soul searching and, and put a lot of effort into strengthening systems. There's another case that I was aware of in, in another member of St. Children where there was a relatively senior member of staff who travelled internationally and worked in different country programmes. 
and that in several of the countries where this person worked, there were rumours, there were um, there was gossip, there was unhappiness about some of the attitudes shown, but there was nothing ever properly investigated. There were grey areas. Nothing really was ever proven or disproven. And in speaking with the staff involved in that over a number of years, there was again a realization that there had been a failure here, a failure really to address these situations properly. And and that again, the, the major hope was uh, that that the issue would go away rather than having a, a hard look and a systematic look at behaviours and what was acceptable and then what what wasn't acceptable. So a different case, but again uh, had a real impact on, on how that member of the organisation uh, behaved. We've had our share of accidents where uh, a failure to address even some basic risks have led to serious injury to children and um, hospitalisation and cases, very rare cases thankfully, where uh, some cases pre probably preventable death has been a very small number of cases. And areas where if a really rigorous risk assessment had taken place, then uh, things could have been done differently and where injury, uh, sometimes serious injury, could have been avoided. And we've also come across cases where people have tried to impersonate our officers and have uh, set, tried to set up bogus organisations claiming to be Save the Children and uh, with criminal intent, trying to make money and trying to abuse children at the same time. So there's been a huge range of cases, a range of histories. Um, I've talked about some of the most extreme ones, but you're more likely to find um, poor procedures uh, near misses um, and are, areas that, that fall into that category of um, uncertainty. Those are more common ones and in, in a sense they're, they're more challenging. So let's talk about uh, the risk to our own organisation. When an organisation like ours fails to safeguard children that we work with, it really does undermine our values and our vision and, and our mission. It, it really does strike to the heart of what we're trying to do and um, can have a very profound negative effect on not just work in that area, but far more wider, for a wider field. We can have a, a huge impact across the organisation. So I would say that when you have a failure in this field, it does strike a blow against our vision and our values and our mission. And of course, our reputation and credibility as an agency that is there to help the most vulnerable children in the world is put at risk. And um, I think we, we are all very, very aware of agencies, bodies, um, where there's been a failure. And I think the biggest reputational damage occurs to an agency that has either tried to cover up some of these issues or has simply failed to learn the lessons from previous incidents. So that if, if there has been a case and, and, and 
the, the, the meaning from that case hasn't led to a strengthening or, or a change in policy and procedure and practice, then those are the organizations who are going to find their reputation and credibility uh, most damaged. And the very worst thing uh, that an agency can do is A, to hope that this sort of thing goes away, or to be even worse, to cover, cover it up and, and hope that nobody finds out. Um, and, and that is uh, something that I'm hoping that little sessions like this will actually help. Um, because as I said earlier, this isn't necessarily an area that we want to talk about. But I, I genuinely don't believe that this is a negative area for us. This is something that we need to show that we are taken seriously and are prepared to be open and forthright about. So I'd like to go on now in the time remaining, just to share some of the fundamental approaches. Please, you know, this this is just uh, sharing our journey. We're still on that journey. And please don't think that, that we think that, that we know all the answers. But as I've mentioned throughout the talk, the, the fundamental approach has been one of, of employing child safeguarding approaches, which are in the main internal facing policies and procedures that try to make our own organization safe for children. And there are um, three broad areas to it. Um, and the fundamental one is about ensuring that everybody, doesn't matter whether they're, they're the, the chief executive or the uh, a trustee on the board, or whether they're a field officer or an accountant or a receptionist or somebody um, who's like the lawyer or who's a security guard. Everybody in the agency needs to be aware of abuse and exploitation and know what to do and how to respond appropriately to that. And, uh, with the staff the size of ours in, in the range of location as well, that in itself is a huge challenge. But without this first step, none of the other stuff can Second area is around the set of behaviours that, that we want uh, our staff to follow. We we want our staff to be clear about uh, some behaviours that we expect from people who, as I said earlier, are in the power, who have the trust of people, and who are representatives of say the children. And then thirdly. It's about assessing and reducing the risks associated with our activities. We work in some of the most dangerous environments. But even there, there are things that we can do, the way in which we plan our work, in the way in which we recruit our staff, in the way in which we train our staff, that will mean that some simple, sometimes even very, very basic steps to safeguard children from further abuse and further exploitation can be taken. A far simpler way is to say that this approach is about controlling what we can control. If you imagine a humanitarian or emergency situation or a longer term development situation, there are many, many things that are beyond the control. However, even in those places, we have found that there are things that we can control, things that we can do differently that will exercise more control to make safer children safe for children. And our approach is very simple. I like simple things. So there's basically four approaches. It's awareness building, as I was saying. Using the risk approach to try and prevent, but then when something does come to our attention, being able to respond to that and to report that properly to the appropriate channels and being very, very clear what those channels are and what those responsibilities are. The other way of looking at this is about how we make, well, 
supremacy, how we are trying to make it stick, how we are, are trying to get this ingrained and integrated into all of our work, whether it's in our work on communications and fundraising, um, advocacy work, or in indirect services. And there are probably a, a number of ways in which you can do this. And what we try to do is, is to try and do it in several of these ways. And there's probably some other ways as well that we haven't thought of. But um, one of the ways that we've done it is to try and get it ingrained in the value system. Um, some people come to work because they have very strong values. And that's what they take pride in. They have very clear moral values. And that's why they choose to come to an agency like ours. And so um, a safeguard and approach is very closely linked to our values. And one of our publicized values and very uh, upfront values is, is this idea of, of an outrage against the abuse of children's rights. And as an agency, we say we are outraged against the abuse of children's rights. And when it is our fault, when it is the behaviour of our own people that leads to an abuse of children's rights, then we are even more outraged. And, and that is very clear. That's a clear message in the agency. Another way that we try to integrate this is by making it the law. Um, one of the most fundamental things we've done is in the law that governs Save the Children, there are some clear laws about who we are and what we do. And the other law is about safeguarding. That is enshrined in the law. It's enshrined in our child safeguarding protocol, which is the overarching law that's covered all members and all parts of the agency. That's very, very clear. And that's not uh, a general law. It's a very clear and distinct law with a set of standards and criteria that we hold people to account on. And we go looking, we do actively look to see uh, how well that law is being applied and at the issues when it's not being applied. And so if an agency isn't actively looking, isn't actively auditing, not actively monitoring, then how on earth do you know whether your activity is safe? Another way of looking at it is that we've we've looked at twin track approach as, as we've just been talking about. There are risks to children. Some people come to work uh, because they are uh, working for children's rights and an abuse of safeguarding is an abuse of that right, uh, of a child's rights. And other people in the organisation, I'm thinking of trustees in particular, very, very concerned about risks to the organisation. And as we've seen, there are risks associated as well. But the key thing, I think, is that it has required leadership at all levels in the organization to make this work. It's been mainstreamed in the roles and responsibilities. People accept that they have a responsibility in the scheme. And also, we have had to commit real resources to this. This doesn't happen on its own accord. It's mainstreamed, yes, but in order for that mainstreaming to work, resources do need to be allocated. So our policy, I've tried to strip it down. Um, as I mentioned, the policy has several standards and policies that have procedures associated to it as well. But the key areas are around training the behaviours and avoiding risks to children. And finally, to wind up, I said I would look at the available support to agencies and the journey that we've been on has been helped very much by working as part of the Keeping Children Coalition. One of the key outcomes of 
that report I talked about in 2002 was an idea that we needed standards in this field. And we've talked about values. And alongside those values, we have adopted the Keeping Children Safe standards, and we've developed those into our own standards. And being part of the coalition has been incredibly helpful for us. And we use some of the material, we have developed some of the material. We've learned an awful lot from the other agencies in the coalition. So they've got standards, they've got materials, they've got consultants, they've got people who just give general advice, and also they've got other agencies who sit alongside you and, and are, are prepared to share their journey as well. So if I was to give any advice, and I'm not to give any advice really, um, my main advice would be that um, keeping children safe is a good starting point if you are embarking on this journey. Uh, and that's, that's where we've got to. And the major aim for this is that we are able to say these sentences on this, this last slide here. Now, you'll notice that some of, of these sentences come from other places. Um, we do need, as agencies, to be able to say with confidence that we do no harm. We don't make things worse. That we can serve with pride. And that we can make organisations safe for children by controlling the things that we can control. So thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure to share some time with you. I hope sharing of our experiences with the same children is of some benefit and some interest to you in the invaluable work that you do. But hopefully as well that you can say that you do no harm and you serve with pride and that your organisations are child safe organisations. Thank you very much.